Thank you. Kia ora tātai. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi a kia ana te atakura, e teo, e huka, e hau, tihei Māori ora. Kia ora, Chia. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. And uh, the person with you there looks uh, just fabulous. <laughs> okay, um, any apologies? No apologies, move on to item two, conflict of interest declarations. Any conflicts, any interests, any declarations? Confessions. <laughs> okay, all right. So, number three, confirmation, confirmation of the minutes of the Hawke's Bay Civil Defence Division Management Group held on the 30th of August. 2021. Circulate any errors or omissions? Being none, Peter Alex moves. would like to move. Sandra will second it. The Dream Team. All those in favour say aye. Contrary aye. no. Carried. Action items from the previous Hawke's Bay Central Civil Defence and Emergency Management Group joint meeting. Ian, over to you. Uh, so there's just two items there. The, the group plan, we've really had to put that on hold at the moment, um, given we were at with COVID and, and all the rest of it. So. And there's also a lot of reviews happening at a national level, which will inform the group plan moving forward. So we've just put that on hold, but we have completed the hazard review. Um, so that was the one thing that we did complete. Um, so we'll just place it on hold. And then the Napier rain hazard report that was that has been done and completed. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions about that? All right. <coughs> uh, someone like to move that the report, Craig will move that be received. Seconded. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Carried. Okay, we're now on to the <coughs> call for minor items not on the agenda. Going, going, gone. <coughs> we're now on to uh, item <coughs> six. Hawke's Bay Civil Defence Emergency Management Review. This is going to be led by Ross. I presume everybody's seen this before, haven't you? Or... One team. Have you got the report, read the report? Ross, over to you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> and you said this, we're going to do this in a very poetic and uh, artful way today. <clears throat> Hello everyone, the, the Chairman did challenge me to uh, make this presentation on my iambic pentameter, but uh, that is beyond my skills even to say the words at the moment, it seems, so uh, I think we'll just stick, stick to his other brief, which was brevity. Um, so. Um, Thank, thank you very much for the time this afternoon. Um, you, we, we, we have had an earlier uh, discussion workshop regarding the report, so I, I won't go uh, through things in, in a great deal of detail. I guess the headline uh, from the review, which uh, involved engaging with all the partners uh, involved in the, the, the response efforts uh, in last year's events, uh, whether there are some real strengths in the arrangements that are in place in uh, Hawke's Bay, uh, some very good relationships uh, between the various agencies working together, uh, some, some uh, y using the events of last year and, and the p pandemic especially, some very good uh, welfare arrangements that were used and that were developed further during uh, that event, um, and um, some, some very good arrangements there. But with, as with uh, any any event that I've certainly had exposure to, it highlights things uh, where, where there's room for uh, further improvement uh, and strengthening of arrangements to take place. And that is the case uh, with, with these events and, and the arrangements we have in place. And that's not meant as an overt criticism, it's uh, what comes through in any event, uh, and it's just a good opportunity to uh, strengthen arrangements uh, further. And as this is about strengthening arrangement further, I'll focus on those a little bit uh, more now. So um, some of the key themes coming through the event, just, just picking up that uh, under the legislation, civil defence emergency management is a collective uh, responsibility of, of the five councils uh, and also then with the partner agencies uh, that work in the, civil, in the emergency management space. Uh, and just making sure that, uh, particularly for prolonged event, uh, the, the collective commitment within the organisations uh, involved matches up with the uh, commitment that's around this table and certainly among the chief executives. And that's just something to work on uh, further as, as uh, the arrangements are strengthened. 
um, so, some work to be done just making sure that the response arrangements that are in place uh, are sort of well understood and that they work for the context of the region. So a few years ago the region um, moved to a more centralised structure that's permitted under the, the Act. Uh, in some ways that, that hasn't provided uh, the support for uh, the mayors and the, and the councils when communities are looking for their councils to uh, to respond and it's just it's not a, a major flaw but it's just making some uh, tweaks to those arrangements so that um, they, they do match with that context. There are supports for the mayor and the chair <coughs> and their leadership roles in the community uh, and that people know uh, and understand um, what what uh, how, how things are going to work in, in particular response scenarios. Um, there's been some very good work done on some of the planning uh, work and the hazard reduction work required uh, in the region and under that legislation. Um, that's not, and it's not to say that that should be moved away from, but uh, the response uh, in the region would uh, benefit from a, a slight greater emphasis being placed on those response arrangements. So strengthening the arrangements so there is that ongoing uh, greater level of focus on response and recovery to an extent as well. Um, one of the things that came through clearly uh, in the event uh, events of 2020 is the need for uh, shared information systems and a common operating platform to enable the agencies to work together uh, more effectively to exchange information in real time to have access to the same information. So that's something that's come forward as a recommendation uh, in the review work. Uh, and then uh, ensuring that alongside that, that response uh, structure, the, the changes to that, uh, that the resourcing and training of, of staff that are going to operate in that uh, is, is focused on and provided for. And also alongside um, the re response structure is, is making sure we revise uh, welfare arrangements to fit in with that new response structure to make sure that, that uh, agencies that are able to uh, deliver a, a welfare response are included within that, that response and those welfare arrangements clearly uh, and that they're all uh, working together. And then there was some interesting feedback came through and a real opportunity because one of the strengths, uh, particularly during the pandemic event, was the engagement with some of the uh, Māori organisations uh, across Hawke's Bay and the role they played in uh, delivery of, of welfare and community support arrangements. Some real um, strengths there to build on that. Uh, I know within the uh, National Review they're looking at iwi and Māori engagement and participation in uh, CDEM uh, and I think that should be a focus uh, coming through uh, from, from this work as well in, in Hawke's Bay and its CDEM arrangements. So that sort of leads into the, pro, uh, the recommendations and I won't uh, talk at length about these as you can see from that slide. Uh, those themes I've just talked about are picked up uh, clearly within those recommendations. Um, the, the operating framework and response structure, uh, getting that emphasis on response and recovery and the common operating platform, some of the key, uh, key arrangements there. And then uh, moving on to the other recommendations, Joe, really focusing on strengthening those working relationships further and providing support uh, for, for mayors and the chair in their um, leadership roles. And also some work around just making sure um, that we're all working on the same page in terms of the, that, those building assessments in an emergency. So that's uh, led into uh, a change program that's been developed uh, to implement those recommendations and this is set out in your report in a little bit of detail um, to, to give you an idea of how that's been picked up and, and elicit any, um, any sort of guidance uh, that you may wish to provide. Um, but we're, uh, I've been asked to, to assist Ian uh, and the team in, in uh, drawing together that change program. It is being resourced. The chief executives are very keen to have that resourced and uh, from within their organisations and also the other partner organisations so that there is leadership for the work being taken within the council organisations and, and particularly within the group staff as well as, as Ian is sort of uh, leading that and I'm, I'm assisting with that work. So. Um, a range of uh, work streams there, resource from across those organisations picking up on those recommendations that have been made. So that uh, really concludes the presentation. Mr Chairman, there, there are um, significant strengths uh, in, in the arrangements and they have served 
the community uh, fairly well in, in the emergency events we've seen. Uh, but as with all uh, events, uh, they highlight usually um, areas where those arrangements can be strengthened and I've, I've talked about those so I won't do so again. So thank you Mr Chairman and happy to answer any questions. Well thank you very much Ross. <clears throat> I just want to thank you publicly for your report. I thought it was uh, insightful. I thought you had uh, fleshed out the issues clearly and set a range of really good options in a very readable way and I thank you for that. So it's been very useful. So open to questions from uh, Committee. We'd like to step up to the, for the first line. Alex. Uh, thank you, Ross. Um, I, I agree, Mr. Chair. That's a um, that's a great report. And uh, you've workshopped. Uh, um, you've taken this and discussed this with each of the councils um, around the region as well. So there's wide there's some understanding from elected members across the region about this. Is that right? Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, we, we haven't quite landed on a time with uh, Wairua as yet, uh, but, but that, um, that, that may follow. Uh, but yes, there is. Uh, have discussed it with all of the, the councils and, and elected members. Yes. Yeah. Well, certainly from a Central Hawke's Bay perspective, we had a good understanding of what you'd covered in the recommendations, and it was really helpful. Thank you. Kirsten, do you have like to add? I don't have any questions as such, but again, just a, I thought a very good report, and um, from my perspective, I, the recommendations very much do focus on those areas that I think some of them personally I experienced. So, looking forward to moving forward. Sandra, um, kia ora, um, and um, likewise, really, it's a very good report, Ross, and, and what highlighted uh, to me when uh, UNN came into our chamber was that. Um, you know, civil defence emergency management is so big for us in Hedetonga and Hastings District that our councillors, through you know what has happened in the past, have felt quite removed uh, from sort of resilience and management and, and understanding how they you know reflect their councillors and their council wards and and those sorts of things. And so I think that you know in terms of that relationship building, I think it's really important that there is. A stronger connection, you know, with councils, you know, with elected members and governors to not just us at this level, but you know, right throughout councillors, because they, you know, when we get um, floods or tsunami warnings and high seas out at Cape Coast, um, you know, those councillors are on the ground doing the work and doing the hard mahi, so they're amongst it all the time, and and so I just think it's yeah, the relationship part of the report is really, really important to me, and making sure that we are connecting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Thanks for getting it done is the number one thing. And, and obviously, you know, you can't do better than learning from, an, from a real life experience, and that's, um, which is great. And yeah, I think the report's great. All right. Uh, Ian, there's a cover sheet here of action. Would you like to go over your report? Um, well, I think the report basically is, is as Ross has outlined in his presentation. You've got your report here, so it talks about a work stream, work stream. Yeah, change so, so there's like a to explain this and how long sure. it's going to do here. So basically, what's happening at the moment is that we're setting up these various work streams, um, yeah. and um, between Ross and myself, working with councils um, to identify key staff to be involved. Um, there's the priority one will be around the uh, operating framework. Um, in terms of our response structure, because once we set on our response structure, everything else sort of flows from that. Um, and then the, and the comma operating platform is another one, which is a key thing. So um, obviously this just gives you a, a sort of a feel for where we're going. Um, we're doing some of these meetings before Christmas, or hopefully we will, COVID willing. Um, and, um, and obviously once we hit the new year, we're getting into it. So, um, yeah, unless there's any other questions on the, on that part of the report. <coughs> well, I've got two. Uh, firstly, it, Ross's report talks about getting closer to the uh, uh, Māori Māori organisations. In particular, I think Nikki. So what are we going to do there? Are we going to invite Nikki to be a, a, a representative, to be an ongoing part of the KEC? 
that a question for me or a question for the committee, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, uh, um, definitely. I think we started off having some conversations um, with the uh, Regional Council Māori Committee, um, and they were very keen to be involved at an operational level and then the next part of the talk is around involvement at a governance level. Um, so I think to a certain extent resources are stretched at the moment um, with Tangata Whenua given the current response to COVID and the, their involvement at the Tai Whenua level um, and through Tihei Māori Ora, um, obviously Ngāti Kahanunu as well. So I think this is definitely something for us to do. Um, um, and I've been sort of working with Pity as well, so I might ask Pity if you've got any comments on this further. Well, before we go to Pity, I just see that it's not on the work programme of this the change programme of one to eight. I can't see it in there. But it's one of Ross's recommendations. Mm. So I want to, next time we come back, I want a programme. You need to talk to Nikki about what it is and how it is, mm. but I want that done. <clears throat> So, so have, you, have you got anything to add? Buddy? Oh, oh you're on mic mute, I think. Sorry. Chair, just picked up uh, your direction, uh, so I'll work closely with Ian in terms of Nikki. Uh, although we have been working with the Māori Committee, we'll extend that to Nikki. I did notice it was part of the report from Ross. Well, it's something we've talk, I've talked to and talked about before. Uh, uh, Te Māori Ora play, uh, played a really important role in the first uh, uh, lockdown. They're going to play a really important role in the future. And uh, I just think they need to be part of the system you know, from top to bottom. I just don't see it working any other way. Uh, it's not going to be uh, like uh, when you're in trouble call Ghostbusters. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the part of the team, they've got to be on the team, and we've got to invite them in, and it should be part of it. So I, I want you to come back with, uh, with a plan for that. The second thing is that uh, in the report, Ross, you talk about <clears throat> standardising uh, matters relating to building consents, houses, etc. Are there any other areas that we could benefit from by standardising our, our reportage and so on? Or is that going to be all covered off by going onto a common operating platform? So I just uh, I don't want to come back and have another instance and say, well, <clears throat> uh, we fixed housing last time, we now need to fix this thing now. So what, what would be important to you? I think through you, uh, Mr Chairman, probably the common operating platform uh, is a good good place through that work stream to start to examine that question further. Uh, I think the, the building assessment one just stood out from, from one of the events last year that, that there, there did need to be some work there. Uh, there probably weren't other areas that, that stood out to that same degree, but we do need to standardise uh, things a, a lot more uh, and the, the common operating platform is seen as a, as a way of uh, picking up a lot of those things in the first instance. So um, I, I would say start with that uh, and if there are other things that come out um, come out uh, through, through that work then we can pick those up and bring them back if necessary. <coughs> if that's what's understood, I'm happy with that. Okay. All right. Uh, the other thing, Ian, is I don't see timelines to these things particularly. That's what we're working on now. So, so overall, I can I can comment on that uh, yep. through you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. That the aim is to have all of these wrapped up within one one year from from now being the inception point. Um, the uh, two uh, first priority work streams, the common operating platform and the. Uh, operating framework we're aiming to have uh, knocked off in the first half of this of next year and reported back to KEG and CDMG by mid-year next year with uh, the proposed directions forward uh, and by then the other work will have started on the other um, other work streams to um, to f uh, finish them off. Those, those two priority work streams as Ian said are the things of which all the other arrangements hang off so that's uh, within the, within the um, program we're working up at the moment that that's the indicative time frame so by the <clears throat> it's be rough enough by october next year uh, we should have knocked off the lot done dusted fixed all right okay any other alex um my question is about uh work uh, work stream number five in phase a which is about the training resourcing and training 
Um, so, so this has been an item that we've discussed quite a number of times about the keeping pace with the training requirements, particularly when we've seen staff and controllers moving through the framework with some pace. Um, is there enough access to the training courses for our controllers? Is there enough space available in the system for them to be participating? Yes, there is, and we've accessed external funding as well, so funding should not be an issue. Good. So um, the issue I've sort of found with controllers um, outside of, of my staff is just trying to actually, I, for them to, to find the space to do the, <coughs> the training given their, um, their other roles as well. So that comes back to the council, us as individual councils connected to the network taking collective responsibility for um, expecting that of our staff and our controllers yep. at a local level yep. to be doing that. And definitely I would talk to the chief executives if that was, a, you know, if that was an issue. But thank you. Supplementary question. <clears throat> it's all very well doing the training, but people need to have experience. So are we, if there's an instance somewhere else, are we offering some of our people the opportunity to go away and work on an actual incident? Well, I think we've had enough incidents within Hawke's Bay recently to give all our staff a bit of experience. Um, but yes, we do. Um, again, the issue with those incidents sometimes is that they are like Buller, for example, very short notice, 24 hours to get somebody there. At that sort of notice, my staff were obviously able to do that, but we did actually get some council staff away in the later half of that response to get that experience. Well, we could <clears throat> set that up in anticipation, though, couldn't we? We could say if there's another incident coming up, uh, there is space here, <clears throat> and you need to be on a day's notice to be able to go and get permission of the chief executive. <laughs> you can teach someone in the classroom how to hit a nail, but it's not until you put a hammer on them or a piece of wood that they actually learn. So practical things make mm. this work. So I'd really like you to have a look at how we could do that. All right, any other questions? OK, would someone like to move the report recommendations? Alex? Yeah. Sandra. Sandra? OK, any, any further questions, debate? All those in favour say aye. 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 Country no, carried. Regional Drought Relief Fund, item seven. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Ross. Stand easy. We'll see you in 12 months with a completed report card. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Maxwell, I presume. Kia ora koutou, committee. <clears throat> so, uh, look, there's no presentation for this paper. I think the paper's uh, pretty straightforward. It pulls together for you a summary of the um, Regional Drought Relief Fund that we um, pulled together for uh, drought relief a couple of years ago now. Uh, it sets out how the money's been utilised uh, during the period uh, post the, the fund being created, including the production of a recent drought resilience strategy, which is published on the Farmers Hub on the Regional Council website. Um, and there's a small amount of money left in the bank following the production of the uh, drought resilience strategy that the, uh, the Disaster Relief Trust agreed to fund. And what we're proposing is that money be um, passed to the Hawke's Bay or the East Coast Rural Support Trust or a charitable organisation set up to support our farming community. So I'm happy to take the paper as read and just answer any questions you might have. Well, just uh, one question quickly for me before I move on. The uh, Drought Resilience Strategy is published on the Regional Council website? Correct. OK, yes. so I can go there and read it myself. It's on the Farmers Hub. Farmers Hub, thank you. Hey, Rick. Anyhow, you, mate. Good. Hey, um, just with this. So it's a great thing, but, you know, in up and wire, we, we find the same people seem to apply for it. Um, like, what, what's your experience of those people giving back um, when there's not a drought to other areas that have a drought? Um, and it's just, yeah, I, like my family personally has never applied for it, and we get a little bit grumpy when others do when they probably don't need it. How do you how do you find out who needs it and who doesn't need it too? 
you know, look, I'm, I'm probably not well positioned to sort of answer that question. What I, what I can say is that um, what the Rural Advisory Group were doing just recently, um, uh, the last summer, not with, obviously the summer and now, was preparing to understand how we could support Canterbury, who particularly were in a pretty difficult position. Um, and they had worked the notion of you know, giving back. Uh, so there was quite a bit of work underway um, to pull together support that I, I'm not exactly sure where that, that landed, but they were prepared to and organising to, to basically pay it back. My impression would be that that's generally how um, rural communities work across New Zealand. I mean, as much as I'd, I'd hate to say it, we're all eventually going to be touched by these sorts of events. Drought's obviously a, a slow burn, insidious matter. Um, equally, we're well overdue for um, a cyclone or a similar event. Uh, your community could be significantly, significantly impacted by that. Um, I suspect that the rest of New Zealand would reach out and support. It's very difficult to, to put a prescription around it. I think it happens yeah. through the goodwill and the leadership that exists in those communities. I guess just probably some onus on people, you know, to give back some time too, you know, if they do, yeah, because I haven't. So, so what we, coming out of the back of the drought, um, I had a sort of a debrief session with Lockie McGillaray who chaired the rag until recently. Um, Lockie's obviously stepped down, um, but we we said we didn't ever want to go back there again in terms of what we had to do to, to get through that. Um, so we've, the, the drought strategy, the resilience strategy, I think is a significant piece in the jigsaw to building resilience on these communities as well. So I think there's an element of how do we how do we help those that need help and how do we ensure that we help those in need and, and pay it forward so we can get it back at some point. But equally, there's a how can we support people to get ready for these things? There is an air of inevitability for natural disasters, whether they're uh, like drought that just sort of slowly creep up on you or, or suddenly occur like earthquakes. So that's very much a focus of... The, the Rural Advisory Group here is how do we help people help themselves in future yeah. as best we can. Alex, do you have a question? Oh, no, I think she just think I'm, I'm comfortable with the recommendation you're making actually. I think it's the right thing to do to take the balance of that fund um, to the Rural Support Trust because uh, a lot of those guys um, volunteered many, many hours uh, into supporting the response last year and so I think it's an uh, appropriate place for that balance of funds to go to. Agree. All right, <clears throat> so we move to the uh, recommendations. Some would like to move <clears throat> the recommendations one, two, and three. Alex Will. Thank you, Craig. All those in favour say aye. 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 Got to know, carried. Right, easy. Thank you. Who is easy, Ian. Hey, National Emergency Management Agency verbal update. <laughs> he was expecting that, I can tell. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, the paper going to government in respect of the sign-off for the uh, change in legislation and the rewrite of the bill went last week. We did expect to actually have that out to you last week, but unfortunately uh, COVID got on that road. Uh, so you will get advice on that soon. Uh, and it's going to be a rewrite. Uh, unfortunately, the discussion period or feedback from the groups is January, February. Not ideal, um, it's in the Christmas period. And I did escalate the uh, concerns Keg raised around the inappropriate or the lack of uh, consultation that was done there uh, and I haven't had a result on that at the moment. What that does mean though, is that the bill will be written by June, uh, put around to everyone to have a look at and hopefully pass within December of next year. This time it's driven by the minister uh, and we don't have a lot of influence unfortunately on it. But hopefully we can get some feedback from the groups even when the uh, legislation is written in June and put out, you still have time through public consultation to actually feedback as well, even though your period in uh, January, February has finished. 
Other than that, uh, we're basically being driven by COVID and the uh, legislation at the moment. That's a very interesting confession that you don't have control over your minister. What's this from a civil servant? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm taking my orders from the minister. Questions? Alex. Um, thanks, Ian. Do you have any idea of how local government as a sector is being involved in the rewrite of this bill because, correct me if I'm wrong, civil defence and emergency management is local government and local government is the civil defence and emergency management. C can you talk to me about the sector involvement? There is um, a targeted engagement and local government is actually being sought as one of those working groups that will be uh, involved in looking at feedback from it. Uh, so some of the CEOs from around the country are actually being targeted to actually provide feedback for us. To During ensure. January and February? During January and February. Another one. Uh, and it may actually go a bit longer than that, obviously, in respect to that aspect, but yes. Not the uh, best time frame to do feedback, to do that. but uh, that is when it is set. And we are looking at working groups there. So when do you expect to tell people, apart from this oral update today, <coughs> that what the, uh, the time of when do we expect to have official advice? I was expecting it last week. Hopefully it'll be this week. Right. So that, the paper is being prepared at the moment. It has gone through and we were hoping to put it to you last week. Unfortunately, COVID got on that road. So it's gone to, the paper's gone through Cabinet? Yes, and it's signed off that we can actually uh, develop the new legislation. So you'll have a Cabinet minute? I would say so, yes. And you'll have a Cabinet paper? Yes. So are you going to release the Cabinet paper and the Cabinet minute so we can read it? I don't know about that, sorry, but I can find out. All right, well, I just think that'd be really helpful. Yeah, probably would. Yeah, so if you get hold of that, we can see what's been done then. That's great. Another interesting read. All right. What else have we got? Any other surprises? What's uh, the next rabbit you want to pull out of the hat? The one that follows that quite closely is the um, obviously the review of the plan and the guide, and that's uh, where we look at the roles and functions of all the uh, agencies we work with, and actually puts a bit of teeth in behind the legislation. Uh, so that one will follow on pretty quickly, um, probably about six June next year, and I would advise uh, obviously to really take a close look at that because that's actually what sets what the groups are going to do and the agencies are going to do and how they look at it and it also carries the financial uh, component of what we pay back as well and we know there are some bits missing in that and we've already had some feedback around where that sits and that looking at animal welfare and uh, areas in that aspect so I strongly recommend it, the groups looking at that aspect of the guide. <clears throat> Backtracking a question the uh, <coughs> civil defence was one stage a <coughs> responsibility of a third tier manager in DIA. It's changed and changed and changed. Would you be a, would you, are you telling me that in actual fact we're looking at having a fully fledged department for emergency management? We have a fully fledged department. We have our own CEO now as well, uh, uh, reporting to his own minister. And Dave Gorn, um, we had hoped to actually bring him to this meeting to talk to you about this and his ideas, where he's going what he sees the role of CDM and how it works nationally. Unfortunately, Dave's a bit busy, but he has committed to come to each group and actually outline where he's seeing CDM going, and obviously Nima leading that, so yes. And the Minister's driving that as well. But will you extend to him our warm and open invitation to come to the first meeting we have next year? We'll put on an extra biscuit on the plate for him. I will do that. Invitation or expectation? Both. <laughs> we'll go for invitation. Have an invitation. So we turn up here, be like the set. Look, he is, he is actually committed to come and see the groups. Unfortunately, as you appreciate, he's a bit snowed under at the moment. Okay. Craig, Sandra, um, the first on anything. It's just, it's just hard. Mm. Hard. This is, this is our ratepayers' money, our staff our frameworks that we are currently looking after our communities in and it's being changed and I think that's just I think it's really disappointing and frustrating and yeah but anyway well let's see what what um, the minute says and what we're looking forward to we've seen some of the background to it but it's just another thing to add to the pile Oh, thank you for the report. Thank you for <laughs> 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 No comment. <laughs> Did you get many invitations to parties? <laughs> 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 no way they're not well attended. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Thanks. <laughs> no problem. I'd like to have a bit of humour about it. <laughs> right. Discussions of minor items on the agenda. There were none, so I declare the meeting closed. Very, very good. It's all right? I like. But you should have had a closing cut of gear before you closed it. Yes. All right, well, you can leave it. Gabby, are you there? I am here, Chair, and I, I notice you have Keith here in the room. Oh, I do. <laughs> Keith. Tuku na tu kia koe na Keith here. Tēnā koe te ranga tika, tēnā tātai, kai te wā mutinga i moe tātai. Ke te maanga i ngā ana hera pono i te toko tori tapu whakumi o mai mātou mino te te aro whanoa, a hera te ano mātou i te rangi i mādi i ngā wā katoa. Ko te maanga i ano heitau toko o mai, a e me āwhine rā. Kia ora tātai. Kia ora. Clear the meeting closed. Good. I was too quick out the starting blocks before. Alex's shock reaction sort of left me, set me spinning. 